conversation with the candidate continues right now. Thank you for clicking on our extended conversation with the candidate with former Vice President Mike Pence, a Republican. The next 30 minutes are commercial free. You get to enjoy all of these great questions from our town hall of New Hampshire voters. We want to line them up and have as many questions as possible. So, Mr. Vice President, we're going to start right off with Nancy Keene. Thanks, Adam. Hi, I, I am a retired educator, so my question is about education. Well, thanks for uh, your service, Nancy. Oh, it was. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, with all the publicity about banning books, banning curriculum, and diverting public funds to private schools, what role do you believe that the federal government has in local education? Well, first, let me commend you for being an educator. My wife, Karen, taught for 30 years, uh, all elementary school. And uh, uh, to know my wife is to know she's a school teacher. That's, that's her passion. That's her love. And I know it's a calling. So thank you for that. Uh, look, I, I'm... I, I'm, as I said, I'm a constitutional conservative. I, I think the Federal Department of Education was one of Jimmy Carter's really bad ideas. And people don't really realize we didn't have a Federal Department of Education before the Carter administration. And, and I'd, I'd like to see the day that we, uh, that we shut down the Federal Department of Education and we return the resources in a block grant to every state in the country to bring about more education opportunities and, and more innovation. So for me, education is a state and local function. And the truth is, the federal government only provides about 5% of education funding in this country. New Hampshire pays for 95% of your schools. Indiana pays for 95% of ours. And I think government that governs least governs best. We ought to set education policy at the local level. That being said, I will tell you that I'm, I'm very concerned about the advent of, uh, of what's known as critical race theory in many of our public schools. And I've been so encouraged to see, to see many parents stepping forward, getting involved in school boards around the country. Because critical race theory to me uh, is simply state-sanctioned racism. It, 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 uh, uh, it, it ends up further dividing our country in, in ways that we ought to be coming together. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we ought to be judged on the content of our character and not our skin color. And uh, critical race theories the opposite of that. Um, I, I also am very concerned about, about the, the radical gender identity agenda that's taken hold in many schools. A foundation that I created in Washington recently weighed in on a federal lawsuit because there's a school system in Iowa where you have to have a written permission slip to get an aspirin from the school nurse, but you can get a gender transition plan from the school health department without ever notifying your parents or getting their permission. And that's just not bad policy. That's crazy. Uh, and we ought to make sure that parents are in the driver's seat, parents are informed, whether it's curriculum uh, or whether it be things that bear upon their own child's health and well-being. But I, I really do believe that empowering parents ultimately to choose where their children go to school, public, private, parochial, or homeschool, is an idea whose time has come. Indiana recently enacted uh, essentially universal school choice. So did Arizona, so did Iowa, and uh, I've been a champion for educational choice and for teachers my whole career, and I'll continue to be. Thank you. Quick follow-up for you, Mr. Vice President. Yeah. Setting aside the particulars, isn't the best place to have the debate over curricula and health information at the local level rather than having the state or the federal government intervene? Well, it's, it's, it's better than having the federal government intervene. I mean, we, you know, when, when I was governor of Indiana, we were constantly fighting against federal bureaucrats. <laughs> Uh, micromanaging our schools and our curriculums. And you're absolutely right that government that governs least governs best, greater accountability. But I think, I think the, what, what is really exciting is the advent of, of universal school choice. We, you, you give parents in New Hampshire, as we did in Indiana, the right to choose whatever school their children attend. I promise you all these issues will get sorted out because parents Parents know what's best, they're going to choose what's best, and schools are going to respond to what parents want to see for their kids, which is a great education and a safe and healthy environment. Next question comes from Laura Landerman-Garber. Welcome to, or welcome back to New Hampshire. Thanks, Laura. I'm sure you're very aware that May is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. Our own Governor Sununu signed a proclamation, and this week, I, I think it's uh, maybe Thursday, um, is National Mental Health Action 
day. So you talked about mental health um, in this in your state of Indiana and the importance of providing it for everyone. I'm a psychologist. I've been a psychologist for 40 years now, Great. and I'm a grandmother as ah. well. And I'm seeing a national mental health crisis. This is yes. a marathon, and it's not a sprint. The children and teenagers that I see um, are in for a long haul in their challenges. I'm very concerned about the 22 plus suicides a day in our military. Mm -hmm. The LGBTQ community is at high risk for mental health crises. And one out of three adolescent girls are considering suicide mm -hmm. and are depressed and or anxious. So given all of that, what are your presidential plans to directly, concretely um, address this issue? And would you be willing to appoint a mental health czar and a commission to go along with that? Well, I, I think it's a marvelous idea. I've never liked the term czar. Me neither. Right. But I don't know what else to use. <laughs> but you make such a great point. Thank you. In the wake of the worst pandemic in 100 years, there's a new epidemic in America. And it's a mental health crisis. Yes, sir. Among young people, among various groups of Americans. And I, I, I think some of it comes out of COVID. I would, you're the psychologist. I, I think some of it comes out of the isolation in COVID. Uh, for young people, uh, I think it also comes out of the isolation in social media, which sounds like an oxymoron, but actually kids that are living on their phone instead of interacting with friends in person end up really struggling with depression and with loneliness. And so I, I, think, I think we've got to lean into this effort. I, I, I mentioned my wife Karen before when one of her initiatives when she was second lady of the United States was called the Prevents Initiative. It was to prevent suicide among our veterans. But during COVID, we broadened it out across the country to kind of raise awareness. My, my wife coined the phrase uh, during those days. She said, it's, it, it's okay to say you're not okay. And it's something I'm sure you, you know. You you tell your patients on a regular basis is just first come, come forward and tell people you're struggling uh, with an issue, and then and then making sure that that states and localities have the resources to come alongside people. But it, in in a very real sense, we're we're going through um, a, for our kids and for many people in the population an, an epidemic of mental health, and 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 we I think we can deal with it. We can look to the experts, we can engage, we can strengthen families in America. I love that Bible verse that says he puts the lonely in families. And so strengthening families is also a way that we deal with helping people achieve a greater sense of wholeness in their lives. Uh, but uh, but at, the, at, at the end of the day, when it comes to people that might represent a threat to themselves or a danger to others, I think we gotta get back to institutional mental health care. I, I, I really do. We, in the 1970s, we all walked away from it as a country. We've improved it. I worked in patient as well. The, well but we've got to keep working on it. And I, I think a great leader, and, and you know this in public service, relies on those who are experts in their fields. We did. And that, when I was governor, that's why we broke ground and built the first mental health mm -hmm. hospital in 30 years in Indiana, because I heard from mental health experts. I heard from law enforcement. They just said, we, we just don't have anywhere to go when we've got someone that has a problem could potentially be a danger to themselves or others. But I think we need to think more broadly about that, particularly, it, it's also the relationship between mental health, uh, benign, not dangerous, issues, and homelessness is, is extraordinary. And there are many people living in, in homeless lives today that, that we ought to, as a nation, have somewhere they can be cared for. And we ought, to, we ought to seek to do that. But I appreciate your work. Thank you very much. And thank you. Next question from Ken Berlin. Hi, Ken. Mr. Vice President, thanks for being here. You bet. Uh, I'm going to switch it to foreign policy a little bit. Sure. Uh, since the Biden administration came in, the relationship with NATO has gotten much better than it was previously. Uh, the countries seem to trust the U.S. better uh, from what I've seen. And uh, there's a feeling now that our word means something. So my question to you is, are you a strong supporter of NATO? And would you keep it going? And if not, you know, why not? But that's what I'd like to ask you. Well, uh, absolutely. 
strong supporter of NATO. It's helped keep the peace since the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you, under our administration, there were a lot of countries in NATO that were not living up to their commitment to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. And we were exceeding that commitment. And frankly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the father of a United States Marine and the father-in-law of a, of a Navy pilot. And uh, I got to tell you that American service members have been carrying the lion's share of the load for NATO for a long time. And I'm proud of the fact before we left office, NATO allies had appropriated another $120 billion in our mutual defense. And it put them all in a position, and us included, to be able to respond to that unprovoked uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, and, and I do think that the Russian aggression has also helped uh, see our NATO allies in Europe wake up and understand the real threat. NATO was existed as a counterweight to Russia to back in the day to the Soviet Union. And, and Russia has proved again that we still need NATO and that that mutual defense agreement that's described in Article 5. Uh, so, yes, but, but I, I, you keep that important transatlantic treaty together, but you hold our allies accountable to their promises and tell them America's going to keep our promise, but you've got to keep yours, and that's how we'll provide for the common defense of freedom-loving nations Great. in Europe and around the world. Thank you. Great Appreciate question. Thank Quick you. follow on that, Mr. Vice President. Yeah. What should the next president be doing about that conflict in Ukraine? Should they continue the Biden administration's policy or find a different one? Well, I strongly support American uh, military support uh, to Ukraine. And I think we ought to continue to support uh, uh, the Ukrainian forces until they, they repel the Russian invasion and restore their sovereignty. The reason I believe that is because uh, I've met Vladimir Putin. Uh, I've never had any illusions about him. Uh, in my debate as vice president in 2016, I called him a small and bullying leader of Russia. That didn't make everybody happy. But I meant what I said, and I knew I was right. My years on the International Relations Committee in Congress, I had no illusions about what he's about, and now the, the world has no doubts about Vladimir Putin. Anybody that thinks that Putin, if he overruns Ukraine, will stop at Ukraine, has what we in Indiana call another think coming. Uh, because he has ambitions about reasserting that sphere of what was the old Soviet Union's influence in Eastern Europe. There's no question in my mind. And so I, I think standing firm, I, I'll tell you the Biden administration, Adam, has not done a good job. They, were, they, they cut off the military aid we were providing to Ukraine that the Obama administration had denied. And then they were slow and have remained slow in providing the Ukrainian military with what they need. In January, we said we were sending 33 Abrams tanks. Now they're saying they'll be there by the end of the year. Uh, and, and they're still holding off on aircraft when other European allies are going to give them F-16s. President Biden said in his State of the Union address, Adam, he said, we're there as long as it takes. And let me say to my friends here in New Hampshire, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, we're the leader of the free world. We're the arsenal of democracy. We give those courageous soldiers in Ukraine what they need. They'll get the job done and will not only put Russia back in its lane, but also you're going to send a deafening message to China uh, that the free world will come together and defend our interests in the Asia Pacific as well. And so for restraining Russia, restraining China, I think we need to continue to provide the Ukrainian military what they need to repel the Russian invasion and restore their sovereignty. Mr. Vice President, we have a uh, question coming in from online uh, before we get back to the town hall, and this touches on something that you mentioned just a few minutes ago. Donald Carpenter asks, what will you do about the homeless population in four years? Well, I, Donald, I think it's, you know, we never talk about it, do we? And yet there's not a major city in America where homelessness is not a widening problem. And, and the other thing we never talk about, as I said, is the relationship between mental health and homelessness. Back when we had institutional health care, uh, mental health care in this country, people who were not necessarily a danger to themselves, but their families that needed support in their care, had a place to take them. We had a place called Mus Muscatatuck Hospital in Indiana. It's a large facility. People were able to be there and... Uh, these fell into disfavor in the 1970s. These institutions did. And rather than reform them and improve them, we abandoned them. 
and, and we turn a lot of people, a generation and more, out onto the streets. And, and I just think that's morally wrong. I think, I think uh, Donald, I think, I think rest restoring uh, institutional mental health care will deal an awful lot with homelessness. But then the other piece is, is look, the, this economy is struggling. I know people like to point to certain statistics, but families are hurting. There are all kinds of Americans on the sidelines. Our administration moved 10 million people from welfare to work. I think, I think the other way that we end, end homelessness in America is by expanding opportunities for jobs, for people to get to work, have gainful employment, uh, and be able to have a place to live and work and, and raise their families. That, to me, so it's about growth, but it's also about recognizing mental health as a very real issue in the homeless population. Next question comes from Patrick Connolly. Good afternoon. Um, my question is about uh, immigration. Uh, there's real shortage of workers. Um, in New Hampshire and in the United States. Um, what would you do as president to increase the scope and the amount of legal immigration and uh, work visas? So my grandfather left Ireland in 1923. Went through Ellis Island, caught a train to Chicago, Illinois, drove a bus for 40 years, the proudest man I ever knew. Michael Richard Pence got to be vice president because Richard Michael Cawley got on a boat in an immigration system in 1923 that worked. It was a merit-based system. My grandfather had to train for a year and a half to become a tailor, you know, to make suits and clothes, because there was a certain quota for tailors from Ireland <laughs> that year, and he applied to meet part of that quota. That was, that was the immigration system that we had. Now, over the decades, we've abandoned that. We've adopted chain migration and all these rather incoherent programs, and. Uh, we have a broken immigration system today. We truly do. Adam Smith, a great philosopher, economist 200 years ago, said, no nation grows but by population. And, and we, ought to, we ought to have an immigration system that is focused on America's needs, a merit-based immigration system, which I, I will tell you we were beginning work on at the tail end of our administration um, because you know, a nation without borders is not a nation. We, we secured the border. We reduced illegal immigration and asylum abuse by 90 percent. And, and I think having secured the border, my sense was the American people were ready to deal with this issue. But now Joe Biden has squandered all of that. We have the worst border crisis in American history. And their administration isn't even talking about trying to fix this system in any serious and meaningful way. I think the next Republican president, and it probably take uh, Republican majorities in the House and the Senate to do it we ought to roll their sleeves up and say, uh, we've got to secure our border, we've got to have rule of law in this country, but we've got to fix a broken immigration system that puts the interest of our nation, the needs of our nation, first and foremost, in, in ways that our immigration system did 100 years ago. We can go back to that idea and, and drive American prosperity for generations. Another online question coming in. Christy Prosser asks, what would you, if elected president, propose to implement to help ensure our schools are safer for our students and teachers? Christy, I appreciate uh, the question. I, um, it, it deeply grieves my heart to think of and to see reports of and to have met with families impacted by violence at our, at our schools. I mean, look, mass shooters are cowards. Uh, they go where they assume people are unarmed. Um, and we simply have just, we, in my view, and as I said before, this is more me as a new grandfather talking. We just ought to get over the debate over whether we're going to fund armed security guards at every public and private school in America. We just ought to do it. And if states aren't doing it, federal government just ought to do it. We're the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't have armed, trained security at every school in this country. Uh, people that, that uh, understand what they're doing. I'm not talking about sitting at a metal desk and not paying any attention. I'm talking about real people that become a part of the fabric of that community, can actually identify students that, that may have issues for which there ought to be an intervention with those students. Uh, and also have, uh, have an eye on the physical security of our schools. We, we owe our kids nothing less than that. I, um, the shooting that took place in Nashville recently just 
I got to tell you, it just broke my heart. I have a very close friend whose daughter was one mile away. His four-year-old daughter was one mile away at a preschool. And if they hadn't taken down that shooter, it was one of the schools that he had apparently scoped out for, for, for further violence. And uh, look, we owe each other to get this past politics. And, and step one ought to be provide the resources for armed and trained security guards in every public or private school in the country. Full stop. Next question comes from Robert Plort. Good afternoon. Hi, Robert. Would you consider Democrats as part of your cabinet to promote bipartisanship in Washington? Well, I don't have anything to announce today, but <laughs> you know, I assisted, I, I ran the transition during the Trump-Pence administration in 2016 and 17. I helped bring in the candidates, uh, candidates for cabinet positions, and I'm very proud of the conservative cabinet that we assembled in the Trump-Pence years. It was an extraordinary group of men and women. And uh, I, I, I would tell you there's some tradition of that. I think, you know, if, I, I think when you're assembling a cabinet that serves all of the American people, you ought to look for the very best men and women in the country who share your agenda. And, and despite all evidence to the contrary, there are conservative Democrats in America. And there's a few of them actually that are in office at the state and federal level. I mean, if you, found, if you found conservative Democrats that were willing to come alongside and be a part of whatever it was that agency advanced, you better believe it. Uh, I, I think any president ought to be open to the best people. Politics comes second, but the very, very best people. And it also sends a message that when you're an administration coming in, you're, you're an administration serving all the American people. Thank you. Next question comes from Mark Boyd. Yeah, welcome back to New Hampshire. It's Thank good you, to see you. Thank you. I, along with many others in New Hampshire, have worked hard our entire life and paid into Social Security. Yeah. We are now counting on it for our retirement because we earned it. Right. How will you protect Social Security for myself, my children, my grandchildren, along with all the others counting on it in New Hampshire? Well, first off, let me tell you, any, anybody that's got hair the same color as me. You've got a little more, though, I've noticed. <laughs> you don't have to worry. You know, we, any reform of Social Security, I think, we can, we can dramatically change this debt crisis that we've talked about that faces our grandchildren and our children if we'll introduce reforms for people under the age of 40, which is to say if you're, if you're retired today, we're going to keep the promises to you. Wealthiest nation on earth will keep the promises in Social Security. Anybody tells you different, don't believe them, okay? Secondly, if you're going to retire in the next 25 years, same goes. We're not, going to, we're not going to change the game that you've paid into and relied on. It's not going to happen. But for Americans under the age of 40, you do a survey, you'll find out. Most Americans, and I, I got three kids under the age of 40. Most Americans under the age of 40 don't think they're going to get anything out of Social Security. I mean, these kids are with it. They're smart. They see the numbers. We're at $30 trillion in national debt today. That's going to be $150 trillion if we don't have some common sense and compassionate reforms in the next 25 years. And the truth is that Social Security and Medicare are slated in the next five to 10 years to hit insolvency, which would mandate cuts in the programs. I, look, I think we have a moral obligation to keep our promises as a nation, but I think you can take these New Deal programs that are 100 years old, you can make them a better deal for younger Americans by introducing things like personal savings accounts, allow them to have some control over their retirement savings. But you leave this thing undone, I'm going to tell you what, uh, those three perfect granddaughters of mine in 25 years are going to be faced with nothing but bad choices. You, if, if you don't reform these systems, uh, I've had... I've had budget experts look me in the eye and say, only one of two choices. 25 years, you don't reform the system, you get to $150 trillion in debt, you're going to have to cut programs people need, or you're going to have to double payroll taxes on working Americans and introduce a European-style welfare system on taxation. And I've got to tell you, those are both bad choices, but it's going to take leadership for us that makes it clear we're going to keep our promises to guys like you and me. We're going to keep our promises to people that are going to re retire in 25 years. 
younger Americans, let's have a conversation about how we improve these programs for them and keep them for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Quick follow on that, Mr. Vice President. Does that involve privatization, partial privatization? What, what are some of the ideas? Well, I remember when I, when I supported President Bush's effort to allow younger Americans take a portion of their Social Security payroll tax and put it into a personal savings account. They rolled out that big $40 word. But it's just right now we'll give you about 1% return on what you put into Social Security. What if I just let you take a little bit of that and put it over in another account and it gets 2%? You double your money. I mean, for younger Americans, we can actually get them greater retirement benefits by harnessing the power of the American free market and call it whatever you want. I, I think it's part of the solution going forward, but it also begins with something one, one, of a, one of our audience members brought up earlier. You know, the last time we brought about meaningful reform in Social Security and Medicare was when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill were in Washington, D.C. I mean, they fought hard. They fought on the issues. But they sat down and they figured out, they extended the life of Social Security by 30 years with an agreement. And there's, there's common sense reforms that can be phased in over time for younger Americans that can do that again. Next it takes question. leadership. Next question comes from Gail Taylor. Hi, Gail. Hello. Um, speaking of leadership, please let me know the ways that you have supported women and girls in all of your years of, in leadership positions. Mm. Well, uh, my daughter went to Yale Law School. My other daughter is a best-selling author. She writes for the Daily Wire. Uh, my wife's had a career in education, so it starts with my family. My mother's 91 years young, went to college the year after my father passed away uh, in her late 50s. She's an amazing person. Um, so the women in my life have always been an inspiration to me by their leadership. Uh, all throughout my career, we, we've had women in senior positions in my office. When I was running for governor of Indiana, uh, I chose a woman to be my lieutenant governor, and, uh, uh, and she's now the, the uh, president of the largest community college system in America and does an incredible job. And so and it, look at our cabinet and the, the women that served on our cabinet and in various senior roles. I, um, uh, I, I, I'm proud of our record uh, advancing, advancing the interests and the career opportunities for women, and uh, I always will. Got about three minutes left in the half hour, Mr. Vice President. So I'm going to follow up here with another foreign policy question for mm -hmm. you. You know, we talked about China. We talked about the southern border. We talked about Ukraine and NATO. Is there a part of the world that worries you where there's a potential national security threat that we don't talk enough about in the United States right now? Our administration worked hard to restore freedom to Venezuela. And Nicolas Maduro is a socialist dictator who took the second most prosperous nation in our hemisphere and impoverished it and created uh, what is a, essentially a narco state, uh, a haven uh, for uh, narcotics and worse coming out of Venezuela today. I I'm deeply disappointed the Biden administration has uh, returned to negotiating with the Maduro regime. They've They've actually allowed them to go back to pumping some oil. They've begun to lessen sanctions, and it's just wrong. We, we made great progress in the last 25 years in advancing uh, democracies uh, across this hemisphere and, and Venezuela collapsing into dictatorship uh, and socialism. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it, it represents a destabilizing force in this hemisphere, and I, I'm someone that Look, I, I, I still believe that there ought to, there ought to be a, a clear message to the world that the Monroe Doctrine is still in spirit alive and well, that this is a hemisphere of freedom and uh, sending messages to other powers, especially China, uh, that we will look after our interest in this region, we'll advance the cause of democracies in this region. Uh, we've got to take care of our own front yard. and. Uh, uh, that'll that'll make America stronger, and it'll improve the quality of life of people all across Central America and South America. Does that involve trying to change the leadership in Venezuela in any way? I mean, what's the next step there? Well, you know, we, we, we were the first nation on earth to recognize Juan Guaido as a legitimate president of Venezuela. He was elected uh, uh, by the National Assembly. And another, after we recognized Juan Guaido, who I met uh, in several trips 
to Venezuela, a courageous young man, extraordinary um, personal story. Sixty nations recognized Juan Guaido, but it broke my heart when the news broke earlier this year, Adam, that largely as a result of the either the neglect or the appeasement of the Biden administration, the National Assembly withdrew its support for Juan Guaido uh, as the interim president. And so we had a viable alternative who was committed to democracy in Venezuela. We were preparing to provide the resources and support for that new government. Uh, but Maduro, who's a murderous dictator, uh, ran out the clock. Uh, now he has an American administration that's willing to, uh, willing to deal with him again. And I don't think it's in America's interest or in the interest of, uh, of democracy. Mr. Vice President, we thank you for joining us on this extended conversation with the candidate. We've hit the half hour mark online and on our mobile app. So thank you to you uh, for joining us for conversation with the candidate. Thank you to our town hall of New Hampshire voters with all your questions. And thank you for watching at home. Thank you.